chance for us to make some changes. Stop blowing smoke up each other's butts. Go in and see if we can turn this thing around. up internet i know that's his line but it's my time i'm mr royal this is ttft and this is dirt and godfrey school is in session <laughs> Ring! where are we going to school at this time baby? today we are going to east side high east side with the uh, 1989 classic starring Morgan Freeman, Lean On Me. Before we get into the show, we have a special announcement. This episode marks, uh, we are exactly six months into our one year commitment. When we first started doing this, we said we would do this for one year uh, and then renegotiate our contracts when that year was up. And now we're at the halfway point. So what does that mean, guys? That means this series will be held hostage. We will keep performing. We will keep doing this. But we have a goal. The goal is, as he mentioned, one year to fully do this, three seasons, and we're halfway through season two. So what does that mean? We gave ourselves a goal of getting to 500, 500 subscribers by the time we get to the end of season three. That's correct. So that means what, guys? That hey, it's all about you supporting us, us supporting you. You love what we do. We love you. So seriously, guys, really, if you want to see the show, if you don't want to see the show go, you go. Yeah. You know. And we do appreciate the support because we've been, we've been, we've been doing pretty well with no, the subscribers. No, we've been doing awesome. We're we're half we're halfway. Uh, we're exactly halfway to our one year goal and in subscribers we are over halfway to 500 so we're on the right track and we will settle for 498 at the end of season 3 because that generally just means YouTube is reviewing our organic followers yet again yeah and uh, and and we have a very special uh, you know if we survive past season 3 and we go into season 4 once we hit 1000 subscribers I say we but actually it's Mr. Royal is going to have a very very special uh treat i'll just say this that if it if we don't get there i won't be the most upset person in the world i know i will be though because i'm looking forward to one getting that many subscribers and seeing don't tell them don't even give them a hint yeah that's the most obscure thing you've ever seen and will see i think it's a safe way to put that all right before uh also before we get into the episode just want to remind you guys to subscribe find us on uh patreon Think about becoming a, uh, a patron of the show. You can uh, do as little as $5 a month or as much as you want to. We have different perks for each level. Um, join our good friends, Andrew Hentz from Plane Trains and Automobiles and the super assistant director, Rain Man and Back to the Futures and Mr. Mr. David Sky. McGifford. David McGifford, yes. Thank you so much. For our, our uh, He's our newest patron. So, uh, My kids can eat now. Yeah. One for you, one for me. Yeah, they can split a happy meal once a month. And that's isn't that ironic? They call it a happy meal. It's ironic. Um, and uh, 
one more thing I just wanted to mention was since we are talking about Lean On Me this episode, I think it's important to note that uh, Joe Clark, who the, uh, the principal that the film was actually based on, he passed away not too long ago on December 29th, 2020. So uh, rest in peace to the uh, legend that inspired this movie. Yes, he must have been a hell of a guy. Or even Morgan Freeman just decided just to go nuclear. But we'll get into that, guys. Yes. So I'll tell you guys what made us uh, really choose this film. Yeah. Let's go right into it. You know, what really made us choose this film, this is a film from our childhood. And this is one of the films that I say when you watch them, each time you find something different. I mean, every single time you find it's it's the reaction. And you're talking about a film. There were some of the best beats I've ever seen in my life in this film. I mean, we'll get to the dialogue later. But just the facial, it's like... It's like, we've talked about this before. When you have a great performer, they, they don't want you not in the scene with them, even though you're not saying anything. They want to get that reaction off of you, that that look. And I saw that all throughout the film. But film. Oh, Morgan Freeman is the master of just staring. Oh, please. Yes. <laughs> yeah, his, oh, don't, don't, don't talk about it. Don't steal my thunder. Okay. All right. This is a chance for us to make some changes. Go in and see if we can turn this thing around. I mean, nobody else wants the job. East Side High was out of control, and then Joe Clark took over. Sometime Take out your pencils and write. I want the name. Every hoodlum, drug dealer, and miscreant on my desk by noon today. They called him crazy. They used to call me crazy, Joe. Well, now they can call me Batman. But crazy for padlocking the doors. You know me 30 years. You know what I would do. Crazy for changing the rules. I want all of you to look at this slovenly, sloppy boy here as an example of how not to dress. But Joe Clark was only crazy about one thing, the kids he cared about. You mess up just once, and you're out of here. I'll help you carry on. You are here for one reason, one reason only. To learn. Morgan Freeman stars in the true story of Joe Clark. My motto is simple. If you do not succeed in life, I don't want you to blame the white man. I want you to blame yourself. From the director of Rocky and the Karate Kid. Welcome to the new East Side High. Lean on me. That was an elevator pitch. What do we got next, Dave? We have, we do our research. This is everything you need to know about the movie and everything you need to know about the time that the movie was released. Hmm. Lean On Me was directed by John G. Abelson, who passed away in 2017. He also directed Rocky and the original Karate Kid trilogy. Yeah, you gotta left that third one off. Uh, are, are, you, are you talking about the, you're not talking about the next Karate Kid, right? There's three Karate Kids with Ralph Macchio. Oh, the, no, you're right. The third one was a classic. That party time! Yeah. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I mean, yeah. You, yeah. The, the, the third time. one was the... Yeah, but but I like the one with Jaden Smith, too. It's just that one in the middle. The next Karate Kid. Yeah. 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 Girls shouldn't be doing karate. All right. Can you email address again? <laughs> Michael Schiffer, the screenwriter, also wrote Crimson Tide and The Peacemaker, as well as the first two Call of Duty games. Lean On Me was released on March 3rd, 1989 in the United States. Uh, in theaters around that time were also Police Academy 6 and Heathers. In March of 1989, Madonna's Like a Prayer premiered on a Pepsi commercial, and I don't even know what that sentence actually means. <laughs> Dustin Hoffman and Meryl Streep win the People's Choice Awards uh, for film, and Bill Cosby and Felicia Rashad win for TV. Dustin Hoffman also won an Academy Award on March 29th for Rain Man. I believe we covered that. Yes. Yes, and I'm making compare. Uh, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, cyanide grapes were found in the city of brotherly love. The and first the African-American soap opera, Generations, premiered on NBC. With a budget of $10 million, it has gone on to make nearly $32 million worldwide. It runs at 1 hour and 48 minutes. It was filmed in New Jersey and also pick up shots in Los Angeles, which IMDB doesn't even know that shit. We found that out during an exclusive interview uh, with um, Karina, uh, Karina Ariave coming up later on in the show, who plays Maria Maria, remind me of East Side High Story, growing up in Plainfield, New Jersey. 
So we'll catch up with her and see if Maria has become a warrior yet. So yeah, it was uh, filmed in New Jersey with uh, the, the high school scenes in the film actually take place at the actual East Side High that the film is based on. And that is We Do Our Research. Let's bring it right on into connections all right guys you know what time it is it's time to put that conjunction in your sentence so we can make it connect and make sense let's do it it's not my book man you're no potent no i feel like you're no potent <clears throat> all right guys it's time for connections you know what that means i'm gonna bring out some things that you never thought you would be able to I don't know, make, make sense in movies. I know I went a little bit overboard last week, and just so you guys know, I still don't know what the hell I was talking about. It's cryptic. It's a, it's a riddle wrapped inside of an enigma wrapped inside of a Rubik's Cube that had baby with a kaleidoscope. And say that one time fast. I am back. All right. Would you believe there was a connection? Even I might be stretching. Now I got to go back and read it. See? Damn you, man. So I'm going to go ahead and tell you this. All right. So I'm going to go ahead and say the first connection I saw in this. I What, what film did we just cover, David? Before Lean on Me? Yes. Coming to America. Right. Would you believe there was a there was a connection between Lean on Me and Coming to America? Coming to America or Coming to America 2? Both. Let's just stick to the original. No, not the original. Oh, yeah. There's one. Randy Watson. How? It's a Randy Watsonism. Right before he drops the mic, what does he do? He 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 does this. And right now, I know you may not know what I'm talking about. Right, here, right, right when Joe comes, oh, right, when Joe goes off the stage, he's like, he almost looks like he wants to drop the mic, but he doesn't do. It. He was like, he gave one of the, out of the million speeches he gave in the movie. He was like, I was like, there it is, boom, coming to America. There we go, guys. All right, see, that's what I do. I'm popping, pop. I like it. He's getting those. Uh, but clearly, I mean, you don't have to be a rocket scientist to understand this. Joe Clark, played by Morgan Freeman, spent, spent the entire movie trying to keep these kids out of prison. And forget, I, see, they, no, 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 see, Joe didn't been to prison before, but this is my point, he went, he, that was jail. He really took a turn for the worst. That's my theory, what we want to talk about. He really, really took a turn for the worst later. And that's how he wound up in a little film I like to call Shawshank Redemption. Okay. Yeah, he went, he went, he went deep, man. He went dark. The system wasn't changing fast enough for Joe. He had to make some changes, you know. Because remember now, they say Morgan Freeman is, is the timeless one. He's, he never gets old. So remember, uh, uh, do uh, uh, Delphine, the uh, Dufresne asked him uh, something about uh, what they they never say what he do. All he says, I was young, I was stupid, I wish I could talk to myself. And uh, he was leaving for me. It was going to drive you fucking crazy, man. All right, Mr. I can buy that. All right. Well, listen. Definitely similar characters. Definitely. Well, yeah, but one, one, yeah, that was, yeah, man. So, just like last week, and I'm still the only man, human man with the brain in America that pointed out that we had two vampires in one scene and coming to America. However, in this one, i like to see that you know that we did have someone um, in Batman, which is Morgan Freeman, mm -hmm. and he also was in the movie with someone, if you say his name three times fast in the mirror, the Candyman. Candyman, Candyman. So Candy we got Man. Batman and Candyman? Who is f***ing with that security guard? No one. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> shit. No one. No one at all. Sick him with the bees. Yes, and so, and what I would, and I would state this. Oh, yes. Would you believe? Oh, but I'm going to take you one step further, and this is why Mr. Royal does his connections. I'll take a sip of beer on this. Let me not, because I'm going to say too much and forget what the f That's how this happened last time. I got too excited. Uh, I, that's what happened. You know, Inception, you can't go that deep. I went too deep, and I couldn't go back out. I heard him say it, Royal. All right, so, oh, yes. So, it went deeper than that. Okay, check this out. Dark Knight connection versus uh, Dark Knight and Lean On Me connection. Clearly, I know you're going to say, wait, Morgan Freeman's in both films? Yeah, Royal. You're sucking. You need to ch switch it up. Oh, no. Bitches. Listen, Mr. Royal knows what he's doing. Let me blow your f***ing mind. With that being said, there's a... There's a... I think I just saw you try to pick him up. No, no. I'm okay. You're so uh, suspicious. I am. I should be. So, with that being said, there's a scene in Lean On Me where... Morgan Freeman character is talking to Sam's on the roof, and, and Sam's is doing that. He's crazy. He's like, he's like, he's like, he's like, he's like, he's talking. See, this Joe has something about it. Joe won't eye contact. It's some little sexual shit. So while he's so he's talking to Sam, Sam holds his head down for just a second. He was like, look at me. And I was like, oh, shit. he sounds like he fled your own dark night. But he was like, look at me. Look at me. <laughs> look at me. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, there we go. And plus, Morgan Freeman was in the movie. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah. There you See, go. there we go. Bring it back around. Last one, Dave. Uh, last one for me was. Um, 
it may be it may be a stretch but for me it was uh that opening scene and we'll talk about it later in the opening scene there's so much chaos going on in there i mean it took if, like we talk about with uh, quentin tarantino films how he has long narrative scenes mm -hmm. there were so many long action drawn out like scenes going on in this and with that being said at one point the only film that it reminded me of you remember the first kingsman movie and he's in that church and all the never saw it that's it's a borderline superhero no man uh -huh. Are you souling me right now? <laughs> no. You are souling me. A time to kill. You're souling me right now. I brought up something thinking damn well you knew about it, just like I did with Soul. He was like, nah, man. <laughs> Never seen it. Never seen it. But yeah. anyway, okay, we're back, man. Okay, let, but anyway, no, there, there's a chaos scene to where, like, there, there's so much happening in that church, and they're all moving so fast, and you'll play clips of it now, just images, but it's just that chaotic. So, so God, you, you're in school, right? No, they're in a church, and that's what I'm saying. Forget, no. The, it's, it's not about the building. It's about the chaos that should not be going on inside this building. Like church and oh, school separate. That's what I'm school, saying. School and lean on me. Church and, 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 and okay, one hundred percent correct. Yes. Yeah, when I was a kid, I uh -oh. I missed a lot of shit in that opening scene that was going on oh, in school. So did I. The main thing I missed was I was like, oh my god, is one of the teachers supplying one of the students with drugs? Are you talking about the guy that first comes in? Yeah, he's not a teacher. Uh, he looked like he was going to class to teach. Oh no, he has some more drugs to sell. <laughs> oh, That's just how chaotic Which, he was the weirdest looking. Oh, yeah, he kept ever. looking at him like, dude, you're a narc. Like, are you going to a business meeting or are you selling drugs? Fucking narc. And the dude does a classic look around and stuff's like yeah. 90 oxys. All right, man, guys, those are connections. If you found any more connections that you can think about, please let us know in the comments. And hey, if we haven't told you right now, we haven't said the S word. It doesn't mean shit. Subscribe. All right, hear me out. Hear me out. I have a theory about Lean On Me. Hear me out about it. Go for it, bro. All right. So the name of the school, the, the school's name is The, the Ghosts. Mm -hmm. And uh, we are in the year 2021. When the movie opens up, it says this took place about 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. That would have been in 2020. 20, or it would have been in uh, 2000, 2001. Why, why would you say that? Because we're watching it in 2021. Oh, what you're saying is they didn't. So, so whenever, actually, for whenever you watched it, no. <laughs> so what I what I think is now when you watch it, you're actually watching a bunch of ghosts because they all still look like they're from the 80s. Hmm. The school still looks like a like a relic from that from the past. Oh. So it's almost like a sixth sense situation where everybody in that school is dead. Now that. Damn, that's okay. You know what? You took down. I, I'm not even. Listen. I, I should have warned. I was going dark with no, this. No, and I'm cool with it. But <laughs> the thing about it is, is that, like, I thought mine was cool, and now yours really means something. And now, I'm, all of a sudden, I'm I like, just thought it was funny when the movie opens up and it's like 20 years ago. I'm like, you don't know when the f I'm watching this. How do you know how many years ago? The, yeah, tw 20 years ago when it wasn't even 20 years ago when, when it came out. That's what I'm saying. So, like, what the f if you think you're going dark, I'm going to go darker. Even when the movie first comes on, first off, let's just start out with it says, uh, it says there's a cult. A cult Drum of violence. That 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 if that wasn't as poetic as to let you know it was gonna go on there. But I say that because violence can be physical, it can mm -hmm. be verbal, it can be mental. It can be ever so slight touches of kids when he walks at the beginning of the movie as he's Joe. Uh, no, I, 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 thought, that, 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 I thought mine was dark. Okay, wait, as, he, as he's walking by, giving. Now, what I'm saying, what I, what I'll say is this: I think I do know what time it is when they say 20 years ago, because that shit would not fly nine days. How he's peru perusing around, touching these, and I'm not saying like he's groping them, but it's, so it's he, even the way he manhandles Sam's up the right, like, just, smacking it, him on oh, the Oh, that's chair. normal. That's normal. That was that was fine. I was just talking about the girls, but I will say this: is there are subtle little things going on in this film. First off, we meet. Kanisha, as she's older, she's in there, she's at school, she just so happened to be at this f***ed up school, and then as soon as she sees a man, as we later learn, learn to be Joe Clark, she like, he walks past her, he's like, oh, this don't say nothing, just walk past her, and then she's like, Mr. Clark, Mr. Clark, he was like, he, we can't see him, he's like, I told you not to say that, and, 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 and I went broke, who's hearing me out is this, who's hearing me out is this, I'm hearing you, I'm not done, and so, <laughs> He looks at her and he's like, didn't I tell you nothing? But he has to play it off. He was like, she's like, she like, can it, from he was like, oh, how your mama been? That's now I'm not gonna go that dark, but I'm just gonna say, hey, mama had to get a life. You saw he, he you said, hey. 
And so, so later on in the movie, of course, the girl, he was like, now you come see me if you need anything. And I do mean anything. So later on, it almost reminds me of that Uncle Rico. Nah, you girls need anything. Anything. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. like, so, so, oh, oh, now it's not so far stretched, is it, David? It's no, like, it any, is, it is. Whatever. Anyway, so later on, you see her come out of a door, and I guarantee you didn't catch this, because I've seen this movie a billion times, and I, I watched it twice today. And that's what I'm saying. So this was I was on my second rewatch when you came over. There's she's sitting outside of the door, and I'm like, oh, this when she pregnant. And I'm like, oh no, it's too early for her to be pregnant. But even though she was, but she's sitting, he's getting ready to go onto a door. The door says, You don't want to miss this period, or you're gonna have to see more than your principal. Oh, yes, you saw that? Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh my god, yeah. that's like one of the worst signs ever. But it took me back. Sign on door, miss the wrong period, and it won't be the principal you're making an appointment to see. Yeah. Bro, I've it just brought me back to that nostalgia moment of how stupid we thought those signs were when we were in school. Like, dude, like who believes this shit? Like, no, I don't like it. So fast forward anyway, the girl gets pregnant. And 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 so Mr. Clark is like, he says, right, let me talk to her alone. He sits there, he sits there, he sits right next to her and gives her that. And he he put the armor, he, he's sitting next to her, he was like, kind of like, what's well, done now? You know, there are options. Like, okay, now, oh, all right, so it's not so far that, fast. That, that is something the baby daddy would say. <laughs> and, then she, and then she was like, I'm keeping it. He was like, all right, all right, it's Regis, right? And he, he, he was trying everything. And then. I, I believe he called an assault on himself. He's like, I gotta get out of this shit, man. F I call the fire chief. Hey, Mr. Clark, Mr. Clark, yeah, oh shit, I gotta go. Oh, I'm in jail. I'm gone. Mr. Byers, take care of everything. So fast forward. He and he won. Why do you think he was smiling at the end? It wasn't because those kids came down there. Cause it was because when one kid came down there and it was Reggie. And when she said, You don't take care of your responsibility, who you think she got that speech from? Who she got that fire from that, that pizzazz? That hey, Mr. Clark, salute. Now hear me out. You must have had to jump through so many. Uh, I'm on to, over just to, Black to, History Month. Slow it down, Tiger. To land, <laughs> to land on to. I land, didn't land on that. Stretch. I didn't land on Plymouth Clock. Plymouth Clock land on her. I just think you have a problem with authority. And you don't. Yo, well, I I respect <laughs> I respect somebody like Joe so, Clark, who says what he means and means what he says. Hey, look at me. <laughs> that's dirty. Oh uh, yeah, hey guys, that was our best hear me out ever. He got dirty and I got filthy. And right. she got an abortion. How about casting call? You mean the swap? Yeah, sure. What? So uh with casting call, what do, what do we do? Tell them, tell them what we guys, do. Guys, with casting call, this is what we do. Um, when I was a child and I used to always watch film, I used to always cast call myself and I started out by saying, I don't think I first said I wanted to be an actor. I was like, I can do that. I'm better than them. I'm better than him. And initially I started asking myself, what roles would I want to play? Well, now we're adults and I'm no longer playing actor. I am an actor and we're no longer playing make believe. We are coming up with a segment to where you guys have seen to what we do is we take an actor or an actress or an animal that we replace from a film that we've seen just in case we ever do any we need to do some animal films before we get cut. Like, mm -hmm. we're gonna get sued soon. So, with that being said, uh, Free Willy? I'll do it on Word Bound. Oh, but please, no, 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 oh, no, uh, Big Dog. Not, like, Land Before Time, no, uh, Big Dog. Never, 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 never in the story. Never, yeah. Thank you, yes, there. So, with that being said, guys, we basically take the characters. Like, for Black Panther, I said, uh, John David Washington for, uh, Black, that was the only guy, and then you said Leon, didn't you? Mm hmm. I think so. Yeah, oh, Child of Leon, he had one name, you saw the similarities. I like it. Um, I only did, uh, I, I only replaced Morgan Freeman so in this I. one. Okay, cool. Gotcha. But you, you go ahead first. Um, I would have liked to see what Eddie Murphy would have done with that role. I think it would have been an interesting way for him to switch his, uh, I think he could have pulled it off, and I think it would have been interesting, and, uh, who knows where his career would have went from that point if he would have uh, taken a role like that. I don't feel so bad about my choice. It's like our choices are offsetting, which is good because I was going down the road of a comedian too. Okay, who? Wait, uh, let me guess. Richard Pryor? No, close. Paul Mooney. Oh, he, yeah. Uh, because yeah. of the, the, the issues in the story. These motherfuckers are gonna crucify me. I'm not gonna have it. You know, because he's a he's a they're a And you know what? It's not church because well, well, that's my God and your God. Like, I could have saw it like at the meetings. Baby. Yeah. Baby. <laughs> like, and don't get me wrong, I don't know if he could have, but because he's gotten serious in his shows before. He's like, no, I'm serious, I'm doing this. But it's just, yeah. it's, but as far as the mannerisms and being serious and telling, like, the way he commands the crowd, the way Joe Clark commanded the room when he came in there. And don't get me wrong, at first I was going to do a cop, but I was like, just give me younger Morgan Freeman to do that role, like, of Morgan Freeman. But yeah, I would love to see Paul Morgan do something like that because we've never seen him truly. We haven't. 
mm-hmm. because of our time act act we've seen him write and reenact but not truly act I, I, I could I think he could have totally pulled it would have been very different than Morgan Freeman's oh, yeah. approach but but I like this better I like yeah. I like this but I would I would pay to see Morgan I mean uh, Paul Mooney in that role yeah yeah uh, in in reality, here's some uh, casting calls that almost happened in Lean on Me. Uh, Sidney Poitier was approached but turned it down because he was familiar with Clark and said he didn't believe in his politics. He even went so far as to call him a fascist. He didn't say misogynistic? He may have, but I, sure I could only that. confirm fascist. And that if you heard in the beginning of the movie when he was uh, when he was in that meeting, somebody actually yelled out and called him a fascist. Yeah, but it's ever so slight. You yeah. caught that? Mm-hmm. Thank you. Good job. Yeah, very good. Uh, Bill Cosby was considered, but producers decided his energy might be too low. They had no idea. Yeah, he had, he, had, he had the energy to deal. What does with, that mean? He had the energy to deal with. Uh, I don't know what you mean. <laughs> Like, like you're talking about like the Quaaludes like from uh, Wolf of Wall Street that those boys were doing on Wall Street? Yeah. Um, Eddie Murphy was actually considered. What wasn't he considered for? Ghostbusters? Mm-hmm. Or, he gets it. Hey, damn, Eddie. If it was the late 80s. It was late 80s. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> 1989. Yeah, yes. um, he, was, he was interested, but he was unable uh, due to being under contract with Paramount. Oh, so I guess you could say uh, no that name there. Yeah, I definitely could see that. Yeah, Danny I, yeah, Glover yeah. Really killed it. Yeah, yeah. I'm too old for this. Shit. Yeah, <laughs> he was. Uh, Danny Glover was in the running, but he was busy making Lethal Weapon Part Deuce. Right. Right. All right. What, what I, do you think Don Cheadle would have did with it? I think he could have killed it. He's. I mean, he's a. Uh, yeah, because he can do comedy, mm-hmm. Oceans, the Oceans right. movies, and the he can Rose obviously Hotel do drama, Rwanda. Hotel Rwanda. Yeah, yeah he would have. Yeah. I mean, I think he would have, if they were to remake Lean on Me. I would love to see him in there. Yeah, he would. If you guys remake it, just give us credit first. Yeah. So, All right, that is Casting Call. It is time for Pop Quiz Hot Shot. These are five facts about Lean on Me, the film. Number five. Real life, Morgan Freeman spent time with the real life Joe Clark to capture his mannerisms and sayings. Additionally, real life students and teachers of East Side High appear as extras in the film. That method was also used when, the, when Denzel Washington, uh, when he did the role of Remember the Titans. That coach, he spent a lot of time with him. Uh, it's, it's, That's another one I have not seen. You were really showing up today. This is sports. Oh yeah, okay. Uh, number four, cameo. In the auditorium scene when Mr. Clark expels the students, uh, young Tay Diggs can be seen Wake up, Snowflake! sitting in the audience. <laughs> he is the one in the blue shirt. And also, Sopranos Michael Imperioli can be seen behind Morgan Freeman. He's one of the students getting expelled. Number three, liberties for all. There was there were several liberties taken in the telling of the real life Joe Clark story. For instance, uh, one example: the film spends a significant amount of time on Clark's dedication and success in improving the test scores, but in reality, Clark never improved test scores during his tenure. <laughs> the school was was never even in jeopardy of being taken over by the state, so they can go go to hell. You know what it reminded me of? Marion Barry was a principal high school. Like he just was there. Like he's like, it was just, he was there for the throne, man. It went about the scores. <laughs> I want to believe in the Morgan Freeman, Joe Clark. I do uh, too. In the film's effort to show how difficult Clark could be, his wife leaves him in the film. In reality, he, he and his wife were still together with three children. Uh, number two, expeditiously. Now, one particular story that you'd think was made up is actually 100% true. The rooftop scene where Joe tells uh, Sam's to jump actually happened. The firing uh, of the music teacher, that actually happened as well. Joe Clark even stated, she was the best teacher I had in the school, but that to me was irrelevant. Because he was going to be the best. (laughs) That sounds just like Joe Clark. Right. (laughs) And number one, after school. Who else sold drugs? You are black racist. Did you know that? Mm-hmm. You know why you are racist? Why? Because you're selling death to your own people. After Ferry's side, Clark went on to run a juvenile detention center in Newark, New Jersey from 1995 to 2002, where he remained under fire even there for his unique and aggressive way of operating. And that is the sequel that I want to see. You go to McDonald's. Get a job. Now you know what? I will. I will unveto that. I, that, that I would see. Yeah. Joe Clark, you got detention. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All 
All right, that is Pop Quiz Hot Shot. It is time for seven minutes in heaven. That's right. Everybody pull out their popcorn condoms because it's time to go. Let's make this thing happen, guys. Uh, David, don't you, uh, if I didn't just say it enough, you know what? Give them the sexual reference. What's seven minutes in heaven? <laughs> just if I, if I didn't just do it. Uh, seven minutes is in, in heaven is when uh, you get. No, I don't really do. Um, no, don't do that, guys. Seven minutes in heaven is what really tell you, like, is when you just these scenes meant so much to you in that moment. You, you literally almost came to the conclusion that you love this movie so much and these were classic moments. David, take it away, please. Which, by the by, I, I, I've never actually spent seven minutes in heaven with a stranger in a closet. No, because situation. first off, number one, I'm claustrophobic, so I can't get more than 20 seconds out of there. Yeah. And for that blood to rush from my head down to my... You know what? Let's go. All right, <clears throat> I have uh, I have two honorable mentions. Um, Just two? Yeah. Well, I have, to, I have my three scenes plus two yeah, honorable three. mentions. You want me to go first? Mm-hmm. Okay, because, uh, yeah, I got a little something going on over But this time I drew little things so I wouldn't, in case it messed up, I knew where to come back to and not let anything else distract me. I'm getting better. It's going to be like f***ing um, uh, Goodwill Hunting by the end of this season. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. <clears throat> God, man. Listen, let me, guys. Okay, and if I didn't say it, I'm going to start with this so just in case I don't miss it. Uh, when I, And I know you have it on yours, too, so it'll be a good segue. That, listen, let me tell you guys something. And that opening scene... The, the welcome to the jungle it transcended time it reminded me of what um it was a you know what it was the first time in my life that i could remember two worlds merging music and film wise i was because like i i i was so used to seeing yes black films just with hip-hop music or seeing mm-hmm. white films with country or just this uh, whatever it is but i'm watching it as a kid and my, not, my, now my, it's like getting high for the first time you hit the j for the first time or smoke you hit the bong or bowl or whatever it's like your mind is something that's another layer to the world so i'm watching that opening scene and all of a sudden i hear and you got to understand i had never heard that song before in my life so i didn't just so to me whenever i hear that song it is synonymous with two things in my life lean on me and the jim rome show mm-hmm. because he, he, he says welcome to you but but before the jim rome show dude Whenever I heard that song, I was like, "Lean on me" song, and one day somebody was like, "What? Yeah. Somebody's gonna kill you for saying that." You're just- <laughs> that opening scene, because uh, I saw that before junior high or high school. That opening scene had me terrified to oh. go to uh, junior high or. You know what it almost school. reminisces of? That opening scene almost seems like the whole movie of American History X. Almost. Well, I mean, not not the racial tone, but you know what I'm saying. That yeah. opening scene almost gives you the whole everything. Yeah, it's almost like a voyeuristic look at it. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think when when. Uh, one of my honorable mentions is the uh, the school song in the bathroom when he pushes Sam's in there. You don't want to go in there. It stinks. But what I really love about that scene is when he doesn't think that they're going to know the song. And when they they come out with it and it's this, this new rendition of it, he has this look on his face that it's the first time you really see him impressed with something. But he's such a roller coaster. He pulls Sam's in the, in the Mrs. Powers class, which is f***ing hilarious how he he pretty much uses Sam's to open the door in the don't Mrs. Don't even get don't even get there yet. Go back to the bathroom scene. What you said this look he had. What did it look like? It looked like a what? Examination. He was all in their face. See, he could see it like that. We uh, we were we were interpreting this character differently because you seem like examining them, judging them. I did see you see it. how he was looking in there? Like, what form of species? When did this happen? He looked like a big that evolved. He was happy. That was him impressed. He was okay, like, go ahead. Go ahead. Okay, go ahead. so he was impressed. He, he was impressed because then he goes into Mrs. Powers' office. He yells at Mrs. Powers. You think he's mad. But then he tells her to take a bow, and it's just so that right there proves that he was very impressed. Oh no, he was impressed. Oh, I agree, he was impressed. Uh, uh, It's just so interesting the way, like his character is so complex. It's so enjoyable to watch and and wonder what he's going to do in any situation because he is, he's he's difficult. He's troubled. He has his demons. But uh, like even in that moment when he is happy about something. He expresses himself in anger to, okay. to like express his satisfaction. Before I go to my next one, I guess because that was one of the scenes I had. Like I said, I we didn't interpret it differently. Like I agree with you that it, he was happy, but in this midst of happiness, I just I I took it from because he like you say he has demons. To me, like you say, even when he's he's I have it somewhere here. Like he's he's happy mad or some shit like that. Like uh, he he got he 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 got so happy he's mad. Speak up. Who told you this? He's angry. He's, he's angry, angry that they had him break care. Right, <laughs> right, right. And then, like you say, he he gets Sam. He, he goes in there. He's like, he goes into the Miss Power. He's like, 
I never authorized you to change this. <laughs> Did I? <laughs> she was like, no, sir, you didn't. I want everyone to learn. Oh, you already know. So yeah, that was that was definitely dope. Uh, uh, real quick, honorable mention. Uh, that scene. It was on like the, it was like a three second scene, but they it, it gave me an all in the family feel because they just let this shit ride. It's satire back in the '80s where you can really get away with blatant racism. But it was the look he gave when we talked about the stare. Uh, when he first decided to put the chains on the doors, our little George Seinfeld uh, boom, uh, doppelganger was like, "I thought you people didn't like chains." Jeez, I didn't hear that. What? Are you kidding I missed me? that part. <laughs> I heard it the first time I watched it. That's a zinger. <laughs> yes, yeah, sir. Yeah, it's something. It's all you people didn't like. We're, they're walking out. He's walking in to go meet with old boy. And he because he first found out, he's like, he's like, what the hell is wow. this about? It? A bunch of people didn't like change. And he looks at him for like seven seconds. Like, oh my gosh. Jesus Christ. <laughs> yeah, wow. You didn't His really jokes see? have terrible timing. Uh, yeah, they do. Okay, so that's, that, that was a short one. Let me get Okay. Oh, I got, I got a short one too. Okay, Just go, go, when, go, go. Uh, my the, my last sound I'll mention is when uh, when Clarence is doing the uh, Mr. Clark impression, uh, and really it's just the it's a damn good impression. Yeah. And uh, what what really is a cherry on top of the cake in that moment is um, when he, you know, you think he can do me? Does he have the juice? <laughs> Does he have? He the went juice? there in person. Yeah. Ask his fourth person. Did you see somebody doing you? Then ask somebody. He didn't even look at the girl. He like. You think you can do me? He's not even looking at her. Like, oh my gosh. Okay. Oh, and then <laughs> cut to him jump her up and good. Okay. I'm back on the roof, man. I'm back on the roof. It's like, at that point, I knew drugs were bad and I had never done any drugs in my life because I was young and I guess that's not an excuse, but I knew that there was something innately wrong with crack, how he was talking to him. And I was just like, I'll never do crack, which I still never have, thank God. And I think it's because of Joe Clark. He was like, you smoke crack, don't you? Don't you? Look at me. You smoke crack. <laughs> I'm like, oh, shit. He was like, yes, sir. He was like, you want to kill yourself? Don't f around with it. Do it expeditiously. I'm yeah. like, he was like, go ahead. Joe, you're basically pushing this motherfucker. Yeah. Like, he was one push away from, from murder. Yeah. And it means a lot when you drop a fuck in a PG 13. That Correct. means it really mean. And right. what he, uh, what with the, uh, the other guy, uh, Mini Clark. Uh, oh, no, no, don't do him like that. No, no. Mm -mm. Clark Smalls. Oh, 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 you talking about Darnell? Um, no, no. Oh, no. Don't do him like that, bro. Yeah, Kid Ray. Yeah, yeah. 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 Uh, cause I, I, I'm just thinking of what he said about, uh, to Sam's on the roof, the way he looks at Kid Ray. He's mm -hmm. like, you will die in a year, yeah. son. Right. You will die in a year. But you know what I loved about that? Or you'll be dead in a year. He cut the same way seven days a week, no matter whether you were black, white, old, young, blue, green, orange, animal, deficient, didn't matter. Teacher, he, student. Teacher, oh, oh no. F police chief or he felt uh, fire the, chief. He 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 if you didn't notice, he treated the students better than he did the teachers. That's true. Because did, why? Yeah. Why? Because he held the, them to a higher standard. Yeah. You hear that, guys? He held them to a higher standard. And let me go. And whatever listen. downfall he saw in the students listen. was a reflection of the teachers. Let's just get done with honorable mentions. For, it was a maybe a three minute scene, but I don't even need to look at my motherfucking book because I'm going to tell you about this. And it's listen. I, I promised myself as a child I would never let a man talk to me like that. Out of all the visceral things he said, when he says, these gentlemen are going to recite the school. Let me do this right now. Oh. These gentlemen are going to recite the school song. I don't want anybody to move. Nobody. <laughs> there may be five seconds into this song. Mr. Darnell picks up a piece of paper and he's like, Mr. Darnell! Mr. Darnell! I said, nobody move. He was like, but I was picking up here. Hey, silence! Go to, go to my office! Immediately! <laughs> I was, Go. I was picking up fast. <laughs> <laughs> Report to my office. So one of the things that missed, everybody jumps to the next scene where he's in the office with Joe. But I saw this on the rewatch, bro. I don't know if there are many panning shots in this film, but he the next time you see him sitting, sitting there with the kids, he's he's like, but hey, in fairness to him, the moment Joe comes in, that motherfucker like, Mr. Clark, can I talk to you, Mr. Clark? He goes, <laughs> <laughs> he has him sitting there with Sam's. <laughs> At the kid. Like he's in trouble. And he, yeah, and he like, comes I was in. just picking up trash. And he, said, no, he, he was like, he was like, that's trash. No, sir. That is what you were picking up. So he's so he's shown Joe Clark is massively shown I can embarrass you in front of a crowd. I can embarrass you one on one. You got some friends you want to bring with you. So to, and then at the end when he he just talk, he's like, I want to kick your ass. <laughs> I I literally think that, that guy broke character because I, I just didn't like I, I'll get to it later, bro, but listen to me. You have to understand what it's like. It takes to innate that in people to bring that out of them. Oh, I could imagine. I think that's how Rick felt during coming to America intro shoot. <laughs> I'm not there yet, Rick. From an I, I ain't got eyes in the back of my head, so I kind of got to. He signed a non-disclosure. All right, my number three. 
My number three is uh, Kanisha, where the scene where she's like, I don't have a place to live. And he says, where's your mother? And she says, she don't want me no more. That That is heartbreaking. Even when I was a, a kid watching it, I remember that is just... I couldn't imagine your I'm mom not, I, I'm not, not wanting you. And then, but that's the first time you see that as hard as Joe is on the outside, he has this heart of gold because he takes her to the house and he's like, he's willing to do whatever needs to happen to, to make this work for them. And then you go to that other scene where ignoring your theory for a moment when she got pregnant and she's like, you know, the, even the way she says, don't please don't be mad at me. It's so... She is a great actress. Oh, yeah. um, you know where she's from, though, because you, you brought it up earlier. You were joking about Mr. Bill Cosby. She's oh, here. yes. I knew I recognized in her. In a different world okay. as well. And Malcolm and Eddie. You want me to keep going? No. Um, I, I also, I like in that, that, that pregnancy scene, the way in the late 80s, when it was even more taboo than it is now, how they subtly danced around the idea of abortion being an acceptable alternative. Uh, because, you know, in the movie, Joe is the moral superior uh, as far as, you know, when, when you're watching the movie, he is like, he is the moral compass. And for him to present that as an option in the 80s, I think mean, that was a brave move for the movie to take. I don't know if it happened in real life, but yeah, pretty much. I mean, those scenes with, with Kenesha and, and Mr. Clark, I think those were some of the best scenes in the movie. <clears throat> I'll say this. Uh, I, I did joke about it earlier with my... Well, I wasn't joking because that was my alternate theory. That's why I call Hear Me Out. It's an uh, abstract theory about what could have really been going on. But um, all jokes aside, that I agree with you 100% on that. That was one of my maybe top two, maybe if not my top scene, because of the fact that I'm not even going to lie, dude. Like, I'm, I'm a man. I don't care. Like, I do that shit made me... Like, I shed a tear watching that shit, dude. Because I'm going to tell you something. As much as... That was one time I thought that's where you're going a moment ago. That was one time where we got to see why Joe was so hard because nobody was fighting for what was truly out there going on with these kids. Mm -hmm. we, we got to see, like you saw how many they pulled up and they're, they're going here. And that reality is not even the worst reality that these kids had to go through. I mean, in, in, in the world we live in, it's been worse. And so to yeah. see that the film go here the, and notice now this, not often that Joe will shut up, mm -hmm. but Joe was surrounded by three powerful women. Now you got Mr. Mr. Vias, you have you have uh, Nakisha's mom and Kanisha. I mean, sorry, Kanisha's mom, and then you have Kanisha. So I will I say, I wish that, her mom killed it in that. Oh scene man, she's like when she's crying, she's like, and I when I sobered Those up, beats. when I got off the drugs, I didn't, I couldn't, you know, I hated what right. I saw when I looked at myself. I didn't want to see me like this. Oh man, that uh, yeah, that's what I'm saying. That's why I, I shed a tear watching that shit, man because you gotta understand, like that could have been my mom, man. Like my dad. My dad died when I was like, I wasn't even four years old, I was three years old. And so imagine, I mean, granted, it's not the same situation. She didn't have to go out and get like, but she had to sacrifice. She has me and my brother to take care of a mortgage, a house, no, all this other stuff. And it's like, uh, even when Joe Clark joked about, he's like, you, you, you embarrass those women. You sit it on welfare. Some of them need that. Like, mm -hmm. like that's a reality. And, and let me tell you something about poverty. Oh, it's not racist. Poverty does not care who you are, it, and it strikes you, and it can change. So I will say, yeah, this. no, a racist system may force predominantly black people into poverty, but poverty is there waiting for anybody that right. that doesn't have. But that's enough. the stigma, though. It's not predominantly black black people. It's predominantly people that look like you, because there are more by number of people that look like you. So again, that's what that's what f me up uh, about this world. That's crazy. That's what f me up because you see what I'm saying. That me and you just had a normal conversation that cut down all the f media bull that they've showed us for years because just by sheer numbers that it's not true but that's my point where i get people to see they're not again they're not just against us they just have a bigger plan against us because they i'm not going to get started into it tonight guys want all my white students to stand up right and he, he and that's what I'm saying. that was a sign of the times you are here because the system put you here they are you think they would be here if they weren't stuck here? <laughs> yeah, they, they they couldn't get away, so they didn't leave, so they're stuck with us. Yeah. And and that's just my whole point, man. So like I said, that was a very powerful scene and like I said, I'm not gonna get up on that tangent, but guys, yeah, that was I'm sorry, that I'm sorry, let me Was that an honorable mention or is that your number three? Oh no, that was number three. No, so that was your three. I was I'm, let me look at one second here. Uh okay. I don't know if you saw this, but to me this is my number two. And this is simply just a beat. This might be I I'm gonna put you know what f I'm saying it. This is the best beat in film history. That's funny you say that. I almost looked up the time in the film because I almost I might get it tattooed on my arm. 
because whenever somebody tries me to this level, I've never seen a human burn a hole through another human in my life until I saw f***ing Joe Clark at that emergency meeting looking at Carmen Sandy f***ing Ago. When he is looking at, because she's talking about him, and he is looking at her like, I don't finna kill this bitch. I am, but, but, and, and I, I call her, uh, in my notes, I refer to her as the Wicked Witch of East Side High. The Wicked Witch of the East. Yeah, I like that. East Side Dude, I, I don't know if mentioned she looks like the bitch who steals Toto. Right. The... That to me, that's what separates again that that level of man. He's a great actor. No, he's not a great actor. This, we've reached Super Saiyan level of acting. Mm -hmm. And they almost didn't. They didn't even really want him in that role. He they, they he was like the default when everything right, else didn't work so out. so nice, he can't do this. And guess and, what? And he didn't really have that much under his belt at that time. But think about this. When has he done something like that since? I think what happened was they're like, Morgan, you're too nice. They said you can't do the same thing when they told Bruce Willis with Die Hard. You can't do this. Like, oh, I'll show them. Mm -hmm. I would, Somebody needs to light a fire in his ass again. I want to see that one more time. I mean, the closest we got was fucking what? Uh, not Angel is Fallen. Yeah, Angel is Fallen. Or because Olympus is Angel is Fallen. Yeah. Get me Rick Banner. <laughs> yeah, I'm trying. I mean, I, I, I got, like... Yeah, I can't think of another character where he's to. like a hard ass. Red, like red, that. but he's he's a nice hard ass in red with Bruce Willis. You know yeah. what I'm saying? So it's like, come on, what about you? But hey, uh, my number two is the first assembly that he holds in the school when he has most of the students come up on the stage, and uh, and he expels half the school. Just there's something about that scene that like. It, the, 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 again, his look, the way he, when, when there's this chaos happening in the school, and it is like... You're talking about the auditorium. And yeah. What does he say when he... Now, as hard as he is, even he was shit by it. What does he say? Is this normal? Yeah, but... Before, yeah, yeah. But, I mean, the way he stands back there and just observes everything, and then he goes up on the stage and just watches and keeps his cool. He never... He raises his voice, but he never really... He Lose doesn't start, like, screaming at them. He's just raising his voice. But he doesn't go any higher than his raised voice. But and before you go forward, what did he learn from looking at them? He learned from looking at them. Like, in my mind, what happened right there, he's like, okay, they're not listening to me. I need to say something that's going to agitate them. But yelling won't help. You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to get right to their soul. Everybody put their cigarettes out. Oh, no, I'm over. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> put it out on the bottom of your soul and, and put, put it in your pocket. Put the butts in your pocket. Put the butts in your pocket. How about I throw them away? <laughs> Thus, the cancer ass started from that day forward. <laughs> But I, I I I like that scene because it's like one of those, you know the challenge that he has ahead of him. You see the problem that needs to be demolished, and this is the first time that you can witness the wrecking ball coming in and doing its thing. And again, it's like it, the the way they sold the chaos of that auditorium was so good. I mean, it felt it was like, only second to one scene I've ever seen, and that was the scene before that in the earlier the movie. Now, no shoot, and no. he but he's there and he's just like. He's like this fierce calm in the midst of all this. It's shit almost like, what on. if the substitute was the pr the principal? Yeah. yeah, something like that. But I'll say this real quick. Just sticking to your scene, real quick, and you can finish. He, you remember now later on in the movie, like to let, look, listen to what you just said. You were like, he was just like, like he's calm. He knows everything that's happened. But nobody else truly knows everything. He says that later in the movie. She was like, and nobody knows what you think. And that's exactly how I like it. Mm -hmm. Like he never tells everybody everything. Right? Yeah. No, that was my number two. I'm, okay. I'm good. Okay. All right. All right. See, remember, I don't put numbers on mine just because some of these movies are so okay. Oh, Jesus Christ! This might be number one, number two. <clears throat> the battle between Mrs. Elliot and Mrs. Mr. Clark is one of the top ten battles I've ever seen in my life. I think you're a bully. I think, and anybody that somebody stands up to you, like, when the, the the almost the line of the movie, if you can pick a line of the movie, when she says, "I knew," and we have to be prepared. We're saying most like you do know what that means, right? You mean to be there, to be ready to do what concert? She's like, "The what? No one of you." Know? She explains it for like seven seconds, but see what most people don't realize. He asked us. He asked a second time. He's like, "What concert?" She was like, "I just told." He didn't ask again because he didn't know. He was in his mind still wrapping up his response. Mm -hmm. And so when she said it again, he was like, "Oh, the concert's oh, it's finished." You like what, cancel? You like what you mean cancel? You do know what that means. So she was like, "Yeah, Joe." He was mentally jacking himself yes, off. Yes, he was. He was like, "God, finish, finish." Oh, done. <laughs> Jesus God. That, hey, yeah, that might. Hey, I'll put a number to that one. Man, that shit was amazing. That was a great scene. Yeah. Uh, my number one is the uh, I would say I would put this up there in the top uh, almost I can't I can't think I mean, it might be the best scene in any movie ever oh, now, come on bro I just uh, that's why I said it's funny that you said that oh the, I mean I'm not I'm not adding it because you said best scene in any movie okay it is, it is there it is there the free Mr. Clark scene 
when uh, when he's laying there in the, in the in the jail cell and you hear them chanting outside and uh, the dude comes in he's like you know uh, how many are there it looks like all of them and the fact that like a few scenes earlier it was conveyed that we can't even get these kids out to school on a saturday but he's moved them so much that they have organized and got together outside of the jail on on this evening to stand up there as long as they need to to free their principal and the way uh, the way he lays there so content uh laying in the bed just looking up smiling almost like he's listening to a really really peaceful song that he loves um and then you you come out uh when he comes out and he's standing behind the wicked witch of the east side high um the way he it's one of those gratifying moments where you get he gets to hear the fruit of all of his labors mm -hmm. outside all of the students talking about him that's such a it's such a moving moment watching him stand there and he and he's so it like, validates the reason why he's been doing it in the first place uh, yeah and you could see pride on his face for the students um and right there, what I really thought, even as a kid, I thought this was so cool about this scene, is that in that moment, you could see a shift in the dynamic between, in the relationship with him and the students. Uh, in the first assembly, he's up there, he's got his bullhorn, he's yelling at them, he's, he's pretty much berating them. Correct. And it seems like in this scene, he's got his sleeves rolled up now, his tie's not on, he doesn't have a suit jacket on. He's just it's like they're almost equals like they're oh, in they're, this fight but they're together. more dressed up now they're more articulate they're more i love that you say mm -hmm. that i do love that man that was and uh and then the f***ing tests come and he shifts gears right there and nah, he tells uh, that mr mayor uh, the, uh, 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 before that what are you doing I, this is what you call control i'll leave you <laughs> oh yeah <laughs> he's yelling after she's coming up there god help us all man <laughs> but it you know he 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 tells the mayor off in front of uh, in front of the the whole school, you know that you know on behalf of myself and the students of Eastside High, you can tell the state to go to hell. That is just such a that is such a feel good scene and awesome climax that it comes up all buttoning up his tie like here comes the photo op. Oh no, you tell you in the state. I thought you were gonna say kiss, man. You tell him go to hell. Yeah, and the movie works so hard for that moment and it pays off so much at yeah. the end when it when it happens. It's, I concur. There, guys, listen, those are 21 minutes in there, but we don't give a f This is a classic movie. Um, listen, like, like like I said, we really love this film, and I think you can see naturally, like, we didn't discuss this too much before, but I guess we've never really discussed our love, how much we really love this movie, man. Yeah. Dude, he, every, it's like, damn, Morgan, you ain't got to be on 10 again, bro. They said I couldn't do it. Look at me. <laughs> Speaking of dialogue, let's move on to you are going to need a bigger boat. Da -da, da -da, da -da, da -da. This is not the sharks. It's the ghosts. All right, guys, I'm going to go ahead and start it off with, again, bigger boat basically means our favorite lines of the film. And I listen, this is I had a lot. I had to start narrowing it down, but I'm going to go ahead and start. I see 10. Oh, so you're in my book. See, I knew it. All right. All right. So actually, it's my, some of them are you. Oh, OK, Um, listen, again, I don't it's really I think I'm, I'm putting the cart before the horse here because at the end I think it's really foreshadowing what I'm going to say the most one of the most um, when I seen uh, if you've seen Hitman uh, the movie scene with Timmy the Old Oliphant oh yeah I uh, remember when when she said she belongs to the uh, Belitnikov or uh, Belikov she, she belongs to Belikov the last time I tried to escape he tattooed, tattooed me and and then they show her briefly he has all his little friends around him and he's beating her and like it shows a flat like she's naked getting beat on like he's not just a sick f to just beat on her because she tried to escape with some slave sh but he has his f friends watching mm -hmm. they almost didn't even do that sh in slavery like like oh yes but anyway whatever point being is the reason why i bring that up is this is that that scene is so f demeaning i never even thought i would see anything that even rivaled it and then joe clark sees sam take food off of someone's plate and he pulls him in front of the schools he says look at this slovenly sloppy boy slovenly sloppy yeah God, <laughs> the articulation of it, if you get up in the morning looking like, like, like you look like this, right. you need to change, <laughs> dude. I was bro, even though I would have knew it was a movie, I'd have been like, man, yo, lighten up, b. Yeah, like, more, more. Uh, seriously, bro, like you laying on a little thick, man. Toughen up, tough love, man. Right, right. The, but that's the, that's up, the beautiful thing the about Joe Clark. Is, is they show him with that shirt on like later in the movie. That crab shirt shows up at, almost at the end. That's what I like about Joe Clark is that he's that. Uh, 
he's that guy that he can get away with that because by him, that's his way of showing that he cares about you, that Great. he wants you to do better. True. Uh, his methods are questionable, but you gotta love him. Um, my number five is uh, one of the first one of the first Clarkisms in the movie when he's walking out with uh, Doctor Napier and he's like, uh, uh, Frank's like, you know, save it for the meeting. Why? I got plenty. That was the first one I wrote down. Uh, I got plenty more. Yeah, that's. And like, I, I was trying to. It was and, and that was that was premonition for what was to come. In the Bro, movie what were we? Thirty seconds did, in there. Yeah, they were and like he twenty. Did have plenty. Ten seconds later, he's standing up on the desk in front of the school board with his talking from in between his legs with his ass in their face. Oh my gosh! I, listen, slap the dog here. Three, two, one. <laughs> This is again. All these things are foreshadowing, guys. What we're gonna, uh, what's gonna happen for me at the end? But uh, there's a, a, a there's a line, a scene. It's almost some old. It's it's, it's he he's almost almost serial killer. Uh, uh, Miss Miss Levi's. She is uh watching the kids do something, and she is enjoying it. And she she's smiling and everything. And he walks up behind her, creeps up behind her. He was like. You having fun? She was like, as a matter of fact, I am. He's like, the fact of the matter is, I haven't heard a word about those test scores. I was like, yo, <laughs> damn, don't throw it off the backboard to yourself. <laughs> you having fun? As a matter of fact, the fact of the matter is. Let her have this moment. <laughs> yeah. Damn, Joe, go ahead. <laughs> I just wanted to make sure that you were in a really good mood before I tell you what a piece of <laughs> you are. How's that 401k looking? <laughs> Jesus Christ, man. Uh, my number four is uh, Darn. Uh, for, I love the I love the relationship between Darnell and and uh, Joe. Do you? Uh, yeah, I mean, it's just one of those great things where you get to watch somebody, you get to watch this rivalry turn into respect. Um, but then when when it was still a rivalry, Darnell's like, "You're you're uh, you're just getting your rocks off by treating me like trash." No, sir, that's what you're picking up. Just it's a simple. Check me. It's a simple one two. But, but not to Darnell. He's getting. But the, that they, the, those two actors. Oh yeah, oh, yeah brought please, everything yes. to life mm. out of it. And that's why I threw them bastards out. And that's all I'm gonna say. <laughs> that's all. I'm gonna say. <laughs> so is that a quote, Joe? Thanks, Joe. All right, my number three is. This is an easy one. It, it just has to be in here, so I wanted to make sure I included it. They used to call me Crazy Joe. Now they can call me Batman. Mm. Classic line. Classic line. That's you know what. That scene reminded me of uh, Remember the Titans. And you can tell them John Brown State Troopers, they definitely reminded me of that. Again, it's one of those it's one of those things that's like an amateur first year writer could easily come up with that line. It's mm -hmm. like a throwaway line, but Morgan Freeman takes it, throws some passion on it, and turns it into poetry. He he, he is the man. He is the man. And and again, to me, like I say, so I said, this is my last, this is my number one. When he when he tells them, or no, as, as I combine it. I have to oh, one A one B. Oh, yeah, I got two left. Okay, good. This is my number two then. When he says, uh, when when he when he calls the meeting, and uh, he's like, Mr. O'Malley, what were you doing? What, what you you were late? He was he was, he was like, uh, he was like, I was doing this. I, was, I guess it's more so of a scene in the line, but so it, that that scene leads into the line where he says, which everybody with hands up, keep them up, keep them up. These are the students you're failing, and they're gonna wind up in the same position. Except they will be staying down the barrel of a gun. <laughs> oh, oh, okay. You need to take all the lines for uh, Joe Morgan. Clark. Yeah, yeah. Well, um, I watched this movie. That scene face. was awesome. And it was. separates. Uh, like, you need a visual. Yeah. First four lines. Step four. <laughs> These are the only. <laughs> uh, my number two is. When he's talking about the uh, the fire chief after he doesn't let him in, and he's talking to the assistant, he's like, you know what he's saying? He can't kick me out. Yep. You know where he's saying that? Out there in the parking lot. The parking lot. <laughs> it made me think of the uh, parking lot from Prince James and all the bills. We said it for some reason. I don't know. He, this, but yeah, that was, yeah. Now, and he, he meant it, man. Uh, and my number one would be, and again, it's, it's because it set the tone at the beginning of the film. And, and when he says this, because it was the first time I had heard the acronym, but I didn't know what it meant, and I'm able to say it. I'm fucking say it. He was like, "And I'm the HNC around here." And it wasn't that he just said it. See, that's the difference between, "Oh, I got, I want to, I want to write a movie." No, because people who want to write a movie, and I'm not making fun of them, they write that down and they think it's a great line. Yeah, but it can be better. And how they did it, like, what, what if he didn't say it? What if he just did the acronym, and then the white dude leans over and says, "Hey, what does he mean by that?" And the sister says, "The head nigga in charge." 
And I bet that white dude was like, like I don't not know what to do. Right, like, right, 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 how do you even respond to that? Yeah. He was like, do I, I, don't move, just wait for yeah. him to do yeah. something and you wait. <laughs> and then how you, how does he even bring it up at dinner with his wife? Like, hun, I just, they have acronyms. <laughs> like, I, 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 I just wish I could have saw that. I don't know, whatever. They're, we're not the only ones, ones that have them. Right, so yeah, so yeah, that was my number one, man, him doing that, man. <laughs> uh, my number one is it's when he when he's in that well, actually that that same meeting that you're talking about um, when he tells the teacher he sa- he says uh, to tear down those cages in the cafeteria if you treat them like animals that's exactly how they will behave what, and what what makes that scene so what makes that line so awesome is that that sets the tone for in the future right before they an hour before they take the test he gets up in the assembly and he what does he tell him he's like you are not inferior so he is practicing exactly what he preached with them with like like who knows like if he because like you said he looked at that one girl's test just 50 days earlier and she was like the complete opposite wrong answer so who knows if he truly believed what he was saying up there on that stage but he knew that i want to stop you but I, i'm glad you brought it up did she look at the wrong answer because that was strange to her uh, well, subsidized that? test. Now, yeah. I don't want to get deep now. You, you know what I mean? Black but for the test, black yes, and white, wrong. Yeah, wrong. Black and white, wrong. Yes. Yeah. Yes, but but so uh, what I loved about that is that at the end he doesn't. Uh, I don't know if he believes or not if they can pass the test, but he knew that what they needed to hear and mm-hmm. was doing that like you know um, you could pretty much manifest reality by you know positive reinforcement. Mm-hmm. Good stuff, man. All right, that is the uh, that's our uh, favorite lines. And what were your favorite lines, guys? Please put it in the comments. Yes. Don't forget yes. to support us on Patreon. Don't forget to listen on Anchor. Don't forget to subscribe on YouTube, and don't forget to go down the rabbit hole of G14 Classified. Not going to say it again. <laughs> Follow us on Instagram too. It is it is uh, it is time for scene stealers guys what that means is we go by the gender neutral best artist award but if you break it down under an umbrella it means the best actor or an actress or again animal and so with that being said guys we had season one we had, you know love you sweetheart i watched you again today miss pam girl she's still so beautiful i'm sexy chocolate man and she's foxy brown let's make coco and with that being said season two david who's been our board leaders the episode one we did vanilla sky that was cameron diaz cd and episode two, we did Tropic Thunder. That was Robert Downey Jr. Lincoln Osiris. Episode three was Django Unchained. And the scene stealer for that was Christoph Waltz. And episode four, Reunited States. No no Never scene since. stealers. <laughs> no uh, actors, actresses in that film. So it gets a pass. Episode 5, our last episode was Coming to America, and that put Eddie Murphy on the board. Uh, and here we are with uh, Lean on Me. Listen. I've got I've got a few. I've got one, two, three, four, five honorable mentions. Jesus Christ. And man. then I got the scenes. So I'm just going to wait. I'm going to let you rock. Riff, man. Just riff, brother. Uh, uh, Robert, whose name I don't want to f*** up. G-U-I-L. I can't even. I, I wrote it too bad to even spell it right. But Frank Napier. I th- I liked I liked him. I think he was awesome in uh in like in all these scenes that are like ultra dramatic. He's always there. If you look, he's always got this like smile on his face. It's this is lightheartedness about him that was that was great. Um, Michael Beach, honorable mention, is Mr. Darnell. That the the rivalry between between him and Morgan Freeman is that that the evolution of their relationship is one of the coolest aspects in the movie all the way to the point where he gives him the thumbs up when he's teaching the class it's so cheese but but it's like that girl like Kanisha said it then he's like a father to us you know Michael Beach needed that Jermaine Hopkins is Thomas Sams again that I mean for being a young actor the emotion that he pulled off from fear to comedy to um to sadness and remorse he was a great actor he deserves an honorable mention uh and the relationship between um sam's and uh and mr clark was another great aspect of the movie um because he's always berating him from a place of love my la- uh, uh, two more honorable mentions uh karen molina is uh karen molina white as kenesha uh, again, for another young actress, the the emotion that she pulled off in the film, like I, she really made me feel for her in 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 her scenes, and 
I'm a, I, when I first saw it, I was like a 10 year old boy. I never was going to have to worry about getting pregnant. <laughs> I was never going to have to worry about my mom not, not uh, see the principal. <laughs> or about my mom not wanting to see, wanting me. Like those two things were so outside of my realm of possibility, but she was such a great actress that she, she somehow managed to make me, uh, f- like feel the full weight, uh, or not, not full weight, but feel it in a, in a big way what she was going through um and my last honorable mention is tyrone jackson uh as as clarence uh, the dude that's doing the uh the impersonation of mr oh, yeah. clark yeah <clears throat> he's every scene he's in he's just a like a welcome comic relief in the movie Definitely. So those are my honorable mentions and i have two honorable mentions my first honorable mention as you men- mentioned earlier uh mr robert guliami Giuliani. Yes. I like that. I like it too. Like Giuliani. That you mean Benson? Yes. Oh, okay. there you go, guy. But uh, my my severe honorable mention, and you know what? She almost uh, was battling for 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 my my scene stealer. But I gotta give a shout out to Miss Beverly Todd. That to have to, on one hand, character wise, play opposite Morgan Freeman, but then also. Uh, as an actress wise play opposite Morgan Freeman now I will say this when we spoke with Maria and we did the interview she was like oh this is not the engine company that's what it is I remember saying it now she's like it's, it's it's not Morgan Freeman Morgan Freeman Morgan Freeman but even to me when I knew that was Morgan Freeman when I saw that I don't even know why I knew him from anything else all yeah. I knew was the movie came on that's Morgan Freeman I don't know why like he, he was a bible character or something like he was yeah. he was that's Morgan Freeman yeah, and you see that Steve Martin. Like, yeah, I don't know why we know, but you just know, innately yeah. know. That's so true. Steve Martin, Morgan Freeman, like, 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 oh, they just got oh, John Candy, grandfathered in him. somehow. Like, 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 like my parents watched them while we we're in their stomach or something. That's the only thing I can think of. Don't sit in front of that TV with the baby. <laughs> it's gonna burn it. They were right. It did f- our brains, and I trusted him. Yeah, yeah, man. Listen. So to me, her performance, man, is so underrated in this film because of the fact that. She has the number one place. To me, she's like a Michelle Obama. Like she, I feel like I'm watching Michelle Obama in a f-ing film, bro. Like mm-hmm. she is so strong, so just everything and to the point where she was ready to quit. And she said, "No, Joe Clock, you listen." He was like, "Oh, well, you go ahead and talk, like mother nigga, please." Like, what do you mean? Oh, you go ahead and talk. Like, are you kidding me? Like, bro, you've been talking this whole f-ing film. Let somebody get a lot. And then she does. She doesn't. She doesn't go ratchet. She doesn't go angry. Black women. She just goes. I'm finna read your ass. I'm finna tell you like what you you always preach about this preach about that. What you don't see is the same people that see in here for you. You know you're the you're you're crucifying them or whatever. And so my point was this is that he didn't let that, even after she said that man he didn't let down on her at all. Even when he's getting arrested in the car, he's looking out the window like they're your responsibility now. You doing Mr. Vias? Mr. Vias? You still hear him like she heard him. Follow and then even even as the, you mentioned earlier, one of the coolest scenes ever in film. He's sitting up there with his legs crossed. The kids come down. He hearing all these things, and the, he t- stepped away from his high for three seconds. He'd be like, "How you come down here? This what you call for?" Like he he needed a, he needed a re up. He had to run to the bathroom real quick. His, his, his wave was coming out. So my point is, she put up with all that man, and she was just like, "I've never seen a person take so much and still be come out with so much class." And her acting ability was on display. She showed range. She showed compassion she cared she put up with this shit. no one put it up more, with more shit than her mm-hmm. and that alone got her uh, uh, i don't know i put it but Mr. Darnell. Mr. Darnell, yeah. <laughs> no sir that's what you were picking up so yeah that's my uh, honorable mention Go uh, ahead, that's sir. a good one yes. um my my scene stealer i have to give it to again i hate doing the lead because it's so easy but the lead. damn morgan freeman just he killed it like I can't think of a single way to improve what he did with that character and in Lean on Me. And he is actually he plays one of my favorite kind of characters and I didn't even realize it as a kid when I was watching it but I but I'd go on to always be kind of attracted to the um they're like the flawed protagonist, the anti-hero mm-hmm. where uh the killmonger. Uh, the I I think um I think of like Dr. House or uh or even dr cox and scrubs there's the they're the the hard asses but you never take offense to like that they're just they're they can be as hard as they want to be and get away with it because you know that they have a very very uh sincere heart they want what's best and uh when morgan freeman when you have somebody like morgan freeman or were who does it as well as morgan freeman um when he's able to develop the character like that and be able to show 
both sides of <clears throat> both sides of the spectrum where he's saying and doing these mean things on the surface but you could see it in his eyes. You could see it in his stare or just his overall demeanor. Did you see the, the one the moment kind of he, smile. You see the one moment where he challenged his own ideology. It was only happened one time in the film. Mm-mm. It was when, I mean, I probably did. But well, when, when Robert, when Robert got up, the Liami says, despite what you think, I'm an HN, I see you. Like, if you're so oh. high on discipline, why don't you start by taking some? Yeah. And then he, he doesn't even turn around. He's just like, uh-huh. <laughs> that's yeah. what we like. Let's go get some to eat. He's like, you think you're bad. Yeah, don't you? you think you're bad. Old <laughs> yeah. But he's so like, he's so complicated and so well. Um, and Morgan Freeman does such a good job at fleshing him out on the camera that it, it, you get these like beautiful moments that are pulled off so easily because the work has been done on developing the character mm-hmm. that you, you, you believe that this character can be two things at the same time because the actor is so well at bringing him to life so you have that like simple shot of him uh smiling and doing the jump rope uh in the gym that that like it hits on an emotional level because you're feeling like you're watching a real hard ass soften a little bit or you're mm-hmm. or they're letting you see the vibes, i just style. heard something you would not believe <laughs> oh my god damn he yeah. almost sound normal for a second he almost broke Joe scores. <laughs> Man, I'm back. <laughs> Damn it. Morgan Freeman, man. He he right. he he killed that character. And like I said, I don't know how close he he did to uh I mean the uh, how close it is to the actual Joe Clark, but he made uh Joe Clark one of the first like heroes that I um that I remember watching growing up and really looking up to. Like this dude is authority, but he's also like f- authority. That is such a crazy paradox. He is the guy that says, do what you're supposed to do. But then you see him like pushing back on, on the powers that be. God bless you. <laughs> Pay your bills, man. <laughs> Morgan <laughs> fucking Freeman. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah I, I agree with you. I don't like uh, just choosing the lead, but I, I'll tell you this. I guess I even doing these last two rewatches, I guess I garnered more respect because I guess it's where you're at in life as a child, adolescent, teenager, adult, whatever, to where. And then especially with social issues that are going on, like they touched on it, but they didn't go too hard on the uh, like, which is fine. It stayed on the surface. But his performance demanded it was almost like a certain point. I thought I was watching I Am Legend. And the reason why I say that, because when he was in the room talking, there was no one there. Mm-hmm. He literally. But there's. 20, 30, 40 people. I'm talking, I ain't talking about silence in a room with two or three people. I'm talking about he is literally making the room his and to demand that presence. And so I, I just, I guess I never thought about it before. I yearned when I saw this movie. I'm like, man, where the f has this been for the last 30 f- years? Clearly he has it. He can do it. And, you know, I mean, and don't get me wrong. Like I say, now he was, he was in, in Shawshank Redemption. Yes, yeah, still is his acting prowess is still on display. However, that vigor that just go out there and do it, is, he's not able to do it. And that's why I say like what I really was thinking, the, the connection earlier between him saying he went off the road, well on the road. But but in all seriousness, what he did with this character, like I, 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 I will put my 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 um, I don't believe in the Academy, but I'll say this. Um, I will uh, put my um, staple on it that as I. I don't even have my little thing out there. Where's he at? See, I guess I don't believe it. See, nice. Okay, bring it to me. Yes. Since they didn't do it, sir, Mr. Morgan Freeman, your Oscar for what you did in Lean on Me the Day. I don't, you weren't even f-ing nominated. Just to be nominated. You were nominated. I'm just saying just to be. He wasn't even. Dude, and I'm serious, bro. I like mean, they were. I think they were going against Rain Man. Again, I say the performance uh, uh, who was the real artistic sublime <laughs> how he was talking how he was thinking setting people up sitting there laying on the bed it, and so, uh, and i'm he, just glad that i didn't have, have to make that choice decision. right because that's I mean, a, that's but, a tough but he one. wasn't even nominated is what i'm saying you said he was going oh, he wasn't mean, going the fact that he wasn't nominated but but, yeah but that's my whole point because guess what guess what everybody it was read a on, slightly different time it was right yeah well <laughs> i yeah. said oh, slightly no 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 i like that it's funny you brought that up because i was thinking earlier remember i went at that point i made in season one when i was like i miss subtle racism that's when everybody was like okay it's not more so killing people and slavery it's more so financial slavery they let the dust settle uh-huh. wherever you landed was where you are and it's like everybody that's when i thought the world had came to oh but was i f-ing wrong but point being is is that what he did with this character he 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 successfully did what most people can't do 
when when you are a really good talented person you play somebody else people see you as that for the rest of your life he mm-hmm. successfully was someone else became that person and came out on the other side yeah, yeah so yeah. morgan freeman damn eddie you got some competition get your ass up on there on that goddamn board morgan you deserve it you sick bastard all right congratulations you should have won oscar <laughs> And it is time now for cast, crew, or you. And we have cast. As mentioned earlier in the episode, Karina Ariabe has joined us. Maria. Maria. She is a Colombian native who moved to New York City at the age of one and grew up to be a successful actress on stage, television, and movies, working since she was a teenager with her first feature film at the age of 18 in Lean On Me with Morgan Freeman and a Broadway debut by the age of 24. Now, she also recently p- played Carla Cordova in Orange is the New Black and was just in an audio theater production of Romeo and Juliet with Lapita Nyong'o. She's also starred in classics we all know and love, and we are very, very, very thrilled and excited to talk to Miss Karina Ariabe. Thank you for being here today, ma'am. Thank you, guys. I'm so I'm excited. <laughs> she just can't hide it. I know. I know. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> no, you're you're excited. I, I I saw you for the first time when I was uh, when we were five years four. I, think I was we, three, no, we were six four. years old. Six years somewhere old. around the eighties. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 So, really? yeah. This is yeah. What was uh, it in? Do you remember? Lean on me. Yes. Watched it many, oh, many times. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And then grew up and recognized you and everything. All, all the other right. you know, 187. And... Right. Those those were the days, right? <laughs> those were the days. They were the days. <laughs> so speaking of Lean on Me, this was your first starring role in a feature film, but you've been training since you were uh, a young child with your mom enrolling you in classes when you expressed an interest. Yeah. What what sparked that interest? You know, um, I don't know if I could put a name to it. I just know that I, you know, as a very young child, I watched a lot of TV, like a lot, okay? And I would, (laughs) you remember Cable Guy when it was like, the TV's TV's a bit, no, yeah. So so I just remember I would uh, run to the bathroom and to the bathroom mirror and I would mimic what I just saw. Like if it was, if I just saw a commercial, I would go and I would, you know, do the commercial in front of the mirror. So I didn't know that that was acting back then. And I was around four or five years old. Um, but so that just sort of kind of intrinsically kind of started to just kind of happen in me. Yeah. I can see that, I mean, especially like when she says growing up watching TV all day, every day. I mean, I didn't play sports. I it literally it was 24 seven and I was I wasn't an only child, but I just know I always had the TV and thus this was born from always being in front of the TV. Now, let me ask you this. Now, clearly a lot of people. And as he mentioned, we know you from playing Maria and Lean on Me. Um, you were a student of Eastside High who initially is a thorn in principal at Joe Clark's side, but eventually taking his side as your character's relationship evolves throughout the film. What was your experience like working with the icon? actors such as Morgan Freeman. Well, yeah, I haven't seen that movie in so long. And I I don't remember that Maria was a thorn in his side, but I guess she was because she was kind of annoying, right? Was she annoying in the beginning? Okay. She was the only one that really, the only student that really stood up. She was the only student that really stood up to him. Right. And then she was like, Mr. Clark, what about the black kids? The black kids going to get everything. What about this? I'm like, yes, fight for your rights. Yes. (laughs) When people, everyone always like repeats that monologue back to me. When they see me, they're like, yeah, yeah. Um, wow, okay, so first of all, okay, Morgan Freeman. Um, he was not like Morgan Freeman back then. So believe it or not, we were all like excited because we're like, oh, we're gonna work with the guy from Electric Company. So we, <laughs> yes, yes. So we all knew him from that. And I'll, I think like the first day he showed up and I think he had these purple, stonewash jeans on and it was so cool and kind of hippie-ish and we were all just sort of like taken by him and he was so kind uh he was like the father we all wanted you know uh yeah and it was strange to see him like transform into joe clark because he was such a just laid back kind of almost like a hippie-ish vibe kind of dude. Yeah. And then we'd see him in the suit. 
Mm, and it was like a completely different person. Uh, he would sit with us and talk with us. And I remember uh, once I, I had a dream about him and he came over and he sat with us. And this was in the, I, be, I think it was the scene in the cafeteria. Um, well, one of them. And I remember telling him, oh, I had a dream about you. And he's like, oh, what was your dream? And I was telling him about my dream and just great memories, just really, really beautiful vibe to him. That's really cool. Um, yeah. And you were working at a real estate office when you landed that role. What Can you talk about what that transition was like, What going from day job to now you're an actress? Yeah, um, the, the, uh, the gentleman who owned the real estate uh, company, I'm actually still in touch with him. And we're like, we're like good friends now, you know, uh, he, he was, God bless him. His name is Joel Aragona. God bless him. Um, he always just let me go out on, on auditions and I had several auditions for lean on me. I had to keep going back and he let me go to, to all of them. So it just, you know, once I did the, once I did the film, you know, it just, I just realized I can't be working full time if I'm going to be auditioning and everything. And it, it was, it was tough to leave there because, you know, they treated me so well and it was, and it was really a fun job. I was sort of like the bilingual liaison between the tenants and, you know, and, you know, the office. Um, so then, but it, it wasn't like, oh, I, you know, left that job and then I didn't work uh, a, a regular sort of job again, I actually um, would, I, I, I worked part-time as a telemarketer. Uh, mm -hmm. But but what was really fun, I had a really great fun job uh, doing customer service for a satellite company that ran all these like pay-per-view specials. Mm -hmm. And I love that job. Like we, uh, it, it was such a, um, you know, like uh, sort of like cheers, like where everybody knows your name. It was that kind of thing. Nice. And anyway, so I would do that like a couple of hours a day and then audition during the day. And so um, it wasn't until uh, I got a part on a soap where it was like, all right, all the other jobs, you know. Stop. Yeah, yeah, exactly. The, the character Maria, um, how would you say that you identify with the character? Would you say you guys are, how were you the same? And let me ask you this, how adversely were you different? Well, um, I would like to think that there's a part of me that is outspoken, um, depending on the subject, depending on the people around me, uh, mainly the subject, like how passionate I feel about it. Um, but so in that way, we're different. Um I would say her passion were also very similar. And I and I, and the way that we're different, I would say that I think she's a little more outspoken than I am. I'm a little a little subtler, <laughs> you know. Um so yeah, and so in in that sense I I I admire her and I wish that in real life I could be more like that. Because right. she doesn't, she doesn't take anything from anyone at any yeah. time or any place. Exactly. She, she, <laughs> and this, and that, I don't know if this is the right time to kind of interject this, but her most outspoken, um, her most outspoken moment, which is maybe at the end, mm -hmm. when you know she's like, you know, uh, when you talk about the law and you're just <laughs> that was actually uh, John's idea, John Avelson. That was not in the script. Oh, and wow. that day when we were filming, there were so many people around. Oh, my God. It was like tons of people. And um, I, I believe the writer was there. And John was just like, you know, Maria would say something. You know, she would say something now. Like, let's, and I think he might have come up with what she said. And mm. he was just like, well, what if you just say something like that? And then I was like, oh, I got to remember it. And then we did it. So that was last minute. Yeah. Wow. That's crazy. That's one of the most powerful parts of the movie. And to know that you just, you got that down right then moments there. before. Yeah. That, it's that's just, awesome. like they were staging a coup, Yeah, <laughs> but, but the right way. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and this wouldn't be the first time that you played a like a troubled student with the redemption arc after a new principal or teacher comes in and takes a special interest. Uh, you went on to play Josie in Dangerous Minds with Michelle Pfeiffer and Rita in 187 with Samuel Jackson. 
So what is your approach when you're playing characters that go through this transformative experience where you have to you have to gain the empathy of the audience at the beginning of the movie before that transition that even happens? I think that you gain empathy from just being human. You know, so if you just play the truth of the character as troubled as they may be, uh, if you just really dive into that truth and, and their humanity peeks through, mm-hmm. then I think that that grabs them, that grabs the, the empathy from the audience, hopefully. Yeah, I remember watching Lean on Me the first time, even though your character was like staged as a um, like a problematic student, you could tell right from your first scene that there was going to be uh, an evolution there in some way or another, like something in your eyes. Yeah, like uh, Spitfire was coming out. Oh, of yeah, mouth, definitely. Like, there, yes. there was, there was, you could see it in your eyes. Head of the student more. union. She was not. You listen. You were fighting for the people's rights before they were. That was, that was very good. Let, let me ask you something because you mentioned this before, and I think it's a really good segue. You mentioned like one, one day you were on set, and it was just so many people. And I know you mentioned the writers and the producers, but the, from the research me and him did, we read that real life students and teachers from the school as, appeared as extras in the film. So I wanted to ask you, what was it like to have? Have you? What was it? like what was that experience was like and have you ever had any other experiences like that to where you worked with so many real life people on set well uh i think that might be the only one i think so i couldn't i don't know i can't like think of anything else honestly that was that was that same um that same situation um and as far as the real people in lean on me the the main one that i remember is joe clark Mm -hmm. he was there a lot and um he was very gracious to us and yeah it was just a good vibe yeah so i think he would be the only one that i really remember in that way honestly it doesn't surprise me that that hasn't happened a lot in your or at all besides that in your career because I, i have to imagine i mean people think to be an extra anybody could do that but even that takes a certain amount of skill and understanding and about patience. being you know knowing your places mm-hmm. continuity so to <clears throat> take the students and teachers from the school and use them as extras that had to be that had to present challenges i just thought of something <laughs> i just thought of something <laughs> i think i think we did that in uh in dangerous minds and um and 187 oh <laughs> Just scratch oh. what I just said. <laughs> yeah, no. It was the actual students from from wow. those schools. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, That's just remember really cool. that. Yeah, I, as, in terms of the teachers, I don't know if it was the teachers. Right. But but the students were like the actual, I mean, you know, the, the, the people, the background was, I think, actual students from uh, those schools. Nice. How do you think that casting call went? Anybody want to be in a movie? Ah, come out on a Saturday, guys. We got a roll for you. We got donuts and water. No money. Yeah. Donuts. And-, <laughs> um, and, and John G. Alvitz- Alvitson, the director, rest in peace. Uh, he also directed two other classics, Rocky and The Karate Kid. Can you talk about what it was like working with him and how you guys came to uh, uh, later work together on the stage production of uh, The Love Junkies of Hell's Kitchen, which you actually wrote and directed? Yeah, um, John, uh, John means a lot to me. Um, so uh, I never spoken about this publicly, but I, I was involved romantically with his son for 11 years. <laughs> so, uh, so I knew him well, you know, personally after the movie, right? Because I met his son was a PA on this on the film set. And so that's where we met. And so John stayed in my life, you know, uh, for all that time. And so, you know, we lost touch. Uh, but then he, um, I remember when, when I think he would call me periodically when, when he would see me in something. Uh, I remember when Crash came out, he, he called me and he told me he saw it and he, that he loved it. And yeah, um, anyway, so then flash forward several years later, uh, I'm doing the love junkies of Hell's Kitchen and I'm putting together the fundraising and, and just everything. And I sent um, the information to um, his ex-wife, which I was also very close with. 
And I guess she forwarded that email to John. And I got an email one day and uh, John was saying, I, I, I heard about your, your script. He's like, I want to be involved. I want to help. And I was just like, mm-hmm. yeah, it was, it was really such a gift. Um, and um, in terms of, go ahead. No, I'm just saying, yeah, that, that, that had to be amazing. I mean, well, I mean, I know, I know he's like a, a personal friend, but he's also the director of Rocky and the Karate, Karate Kid. Kid. And yes. lean on me. To, to have somebody like that express interest in something that you've written, it must have been very validating. It, it really was. And um, in terms of working with him as a director, you know, I don't remember one negative moment. You know, he's just, he is really an actor's director Mm -hmm. where he really, he works with you. He talks with you. He's, his, his tone is gentle, understanding. He listens and it was wonderful. That is amazing. We, we've talked to a lot of other actors and actresses such as yourself, and they all, for the most part, um, they have something in common. They say that when they have been on, film sets they try to soak up knowledge not if, just because you're acting doesn't mean you don't look at the pa you don't look at the director you try to learn so let me ask you this lean on me from what we researched this was your first time being on the set of a feature film is there anything in particular that you learned during the production that's stayed with you ever since well when you know that scene that we were talking about where she's standing up you know for everyone's rights and everything <clears throat> well i didn't know i had no one told me how many times we were gonna do it <laughs> We, I think we did it at least 25 times. And I was like, and no one prepared me for that. No <laughs> one said, you know what, we're going to, you know. Um, and, uh, and I just kept thinking, what am I doing wrong? Why do I have to keep doing it over? So, I mean, that's, I, I definitely learned that on that film that you just, you know, sometimes you just got to keep doing it and doing it. Everybody back to one. <laughs> yeah, oh, my God. <laughs> I was just like, what is this? This is torture. <laughs> what kind of hell did I sign up for? No, I'm being pranked. <laughs> I, I mean, what is that? What is that like as a as a performer that you're bringing this scene to life? Like as you're going through like the twentieth take, is there ever a point where you go from like I don't even know what these words mean anymore because I've said them so many times, and then it circles all the way back around to like you are embodying the words does uh, is there ever like something like that that happens i i think what i what the way that i deal with it now is i think the way that i dealt with it then which was don't think about it just do it just go go again just just you know because you don't want to spend too much time going oh my god we have to do it again all that energy of oh my god we have to do it again just put it right back into the next take yeah. so right. you're almost like uh, okay, fine. Whatever you're feeling, just put it in the next thing. Put it in the. It's almost like a, you know, like this kind of thing versus, right? Versus, yeah. you know, just smooth. Just go yeah. right into it. Don't think about it. Just, just, just do it. Yeah, because everybody else yeah. is doing it 25 times with you, so they're probably just as for. They don't have any lines. They just keep walking by. Do it again. All right. <laughs> it's not, and it's not that I that I minded doing it, but no one. Well, I mean. I guess part of me did mind because I felt like, what am I doing wrong? You know, but it's not that it was, it was, it was torturous in its, in an, in and of itself. It's just, no one prepared me for it. Yeah. But in yeah. terms of the, in terms of the set, what I remember, you know, which I've sort of realized is that that, that was pure excitement of being on that set. Cause it was like, we were, we were all so young and there was just this excitement and, it was like, I think probably all of our fa- uh, first movie, there may have been one or two people that, had, or, you know, done a film before, but we were all pretty much, uh, you know, beginners. And, you know, what I realized is that as time went on, that excitement became replaced by terror. <laughs> so, <laughs> it's almost like, it's almost like the less you know, the better you, off you are, you're just like yeah. sort of oblivious to, you know, um, uh, what, what's at stake. And you're just like, la la la, I'm just a kid in my mm-hmm. first movie. And then as, as your career starts building and, and things start taking on more weight, 
you know, it, it goes from, ex for me, that's what happened. It went from excitement to, oh gosh, I hope I don't mess up, you know? Yeah. yeah. There was a review that I read research in this that the, the reviewer specifically said, and, and I, and I, it's very true. When you watch the movie, he says you could feel the excitement in the director and in the cast because that it just, it comes out in the, in the finished product that there was this joy to be doing this. Mm -hmm. Really? In for Lean On Me? Mm -hmm. Wow. Yeah. But that speaks to what you said, Karina. You, you basically said that he was a, act, a director's actor or actor's director, if you will, because again, I feel like I've been on sets to where I've seen directors uh, belittle and demean people, but I've also been on sets to where me and him have ran and we run a respectable set. So it's all about making that actor and actress feel comfortable. So before we leave the film, I did want to ask you that this is because you actually gave us one scene earlier. You told us your, your last scene was given, your, those words were given to you at the last moment. But let me ask you this. Is there for the, this is a cult classic. So for any of the fans of the film out there, is there anything else that you would like to fan the fans of the film to know? know or to share that they may not know? Well, I guess that um, maybe that a uh, part of the movie was filmed in LA. We oh, did some, right. yeah, okay. we did some, we did some pickups um, um, in Los Angeles and that was so fun just to get flown, to be out there and to just be like, oh, we're, you know, cause we went from shooting at the actual school, you mm -hmm. know, which was like, all right, we're just in a high school, you know? to then being on um on a lot on a studio lot you know doing doing pickups and um that was uh, remember the scene where it's just a little cutaway where uh maria's reading and then she, the food is the burgers are burning right and, yeah that was in la wow that's crazy imdb yeah. doesn't even know that they uh they only have the filming locations listed as uh new jersey but now we have it yeah, well, I thought the update that. <laughs> Miss Karina Arayave, we thank you so much for taking this pandemic time out for us and blessing us here on TTFT. May your career do nothing but skyrocket and stay high. And thank you so much, ma'am. Any parting words? Uh, just thank you so much. This has been this has been so fun, and thank you for taking an interest in my career. And and um, I guess my parting words would be to uh, this is coming out soon, right? So we'll still yes. be in pandemic mode. Um, yes. Yeah. I just yeah. I mean, I th I think we're gonna get through this, and I think we are going to go back to normal. And uh, I want to, you know, I really believe that, and I just want to offer some hope that you know we're, we're, we're we can see the finish line and. You know, there's so many people want to say, no, it's going to change the world forever. It's not. We're going to be fine. That's what I think. Um, I think it has changed the world forever, but in a lot of positive ways, like com big companies now know that people don't have to waste their time coming into an establishment to get a job done. I'm I mean, never going back. I mean, we're, we're talking <laughs> right now. There's a lot of yeah. good things that have come out of this yes. um, that I think we, we can learn lessons from, which is. Yes. Yeah, but that, you, per perfect last words. And you will be getting one more Instagram follower tonight, and that will be me. Because listen, I got to see all the quirkiness and, and everything. But again, thank you so much, ma'am. Please enjoy the rest of your evening, and we will be in contact soon. Thank you guys so much. Have a great night. Thank, thank you. you. All the best. Bye. You too. All right. Thank you, Miss Karina Ariave. All right. We want to thank you for that, guys. And as we move on, you know what time it is, David? It is time to improve some sh Room for improvement. All right. When we talk about room for improvement, guys, that's exactly what it is. What would what would we have improved about the film? And to be honest with you, I was searching for a lot of things, and sometimes you feel nostalgic about it, and you're like, okay, what can I improve? What can I do this? What can I do that? Now, don't get me wrong. There were. I don't need every film to be a Scorsese film, so I'm not going to hold every film to a Scorsese standard or a Spike Lee standard because this film stood on its own. I think the director really caught, did what he wanted to do with this film, mm -hmm. and for me to say this, that, and the other, I, again... And you know he edited it too. I saw. I did. I never noticed that. So I watched well, it today. Yeah. I've seen people do that before, and and I'm I'm glad to see a bit, with a, with a project like that you want to be hands on with it because mm -hmm. the wrong cut or the wrong fade or the cross fade in the middle of a film yeah. for no reason you might not like it. So, but with that being said, I do want to say this is that uh, one only thing I think that I would have changed is what you just said. I changed my mind that. I would want a sequel. I want to see what the f*** would have happened at that detention center you told me about earlier. I really would like to see that sequel. What was it? Lean on... You got detention. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I, that would be such a crazy story. Because <laughs> if he was like that with kids, what the hell is he like And he, he like can still play it, though. 
That's what's crazy. Oh yeah, you could. <laughs> That's what's fucking with me. Like, hey, what we call talking? Hey, we're gonna pin it. We yeah. want to see it so bad. Uh, <laughs> my my the one thing that I would uh, that I would change in this, and I don't even know if it's up for change because again, I don't know what what aspects of the story were um, like made more fantastical for the purpose of making the movie entertaining or what was actually true but the uh, just assuming here that this was a written piece of fiction what i would change about it in the story is that the catalyst for the, the pretty much the, the the catalyst in the plot didn't make much sense to me the mayor uh the mayor at the beginning he's put in the position where this school is doing so bad and it's going to put his job in jeopardy mm -hmm. so he quickly realizes that he is the uh that that he has no choice but to choose joe clark because no one else is going to do it he didn't say that no no uh, uh, no uh, benson's character did it. He said he, he he spoke to him. He said Benson's character said that, but he conceded the fact he that did. Joe Clark. He was like, oh no! There, it, it was a quick conceit. Too. He was like, all right, this, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, point is, is that he had no choice but Joe Clark, or and 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 if and, and if he didn't improve the school, he was going to lose his job. Cut to Joe Clark is there. Joe Clark is improving the school, but the same mayor. For he does this supposedly for the sake of getting elected. For one single vote from one disgruntled parent, the Wicked Witch of the East Side, he he agrees to conspire with the fire chief to put Joe Clark in the position to be uh, removed from principal of the school. This would essentially, and he's supposedly doing this to make sure that he gets elected again. He originally put Joe Clark there to make sure that he doesn't lose his job. Joe Clark is actually improving the school. We have one angry parent that is unhappy with his methods because her kid got thrown out. And so for one vote, I'm to believe that he's going to put all this into motion to have the solution, his last resort solution, to save the school and save his job, thrown out of the school, essentially putting him back at square one without a solution and the school going down the hill again and his job being back in jeopardy. It just, it, it didn't make a lot of sense to me. I request elaboration. So, with well, that being said, I'm going off of what you just said. I, I can see where you're coming from. Okay, but I, I think what we have here is if Barney from The Simpsons grew up to become mayor, that would be this guy. Um, because he's fumbling and bumbling and doing whatever he can to try and, like you say, stay afloat no matter what it is. Initially, the threat was, I'm going to lose my job because this school needs to get the test scores and the paper, things of that nature. So he's like, okay, damn, he's the only one crazy enough to take the job home. Get him in there because now that fire is put out. Then, like you say, not only just the disgruntled parent, her kid got put out. He's probably full of shit anyway. The kid was bad kid. Mm -hmm. She gets there. Now she gets there. And now when she's just a disgruntled parent, she's been embarrassed by Joe Clark at this meeting. So now you have an angry black woman that's been belittled and her son's been put out of school, meaning she got to watch this motherfucker. So with all that being said, now she gets onto the school board, the school board who hired him. So if you hire somebody, you have the power to fire him. So now he ain't got one person on his ass. He has the school board on his ass. Which is, and not, not who's, who's headlining the school board? This this wicked witch of the East. And she said, I got people lined up. I can get you. So wait a minute, you just saved your job. And this is talking about getting it taken away in a whole nother way. Like, I'll organize. I'll do this. And see, Joe Clark is off the handle. He's, he's, yeah, he's yeah. fired. She is calculated. I don't make idle threats. And guess what? He didn't leave that room. People like, all right, let's get over there and see what we can do. So... I, I think she was the perfect protagonist because while Joe Joe Clark was he really truly did care she didn't give a f it was all a she truly oh was she a, was a she was a great antagonist oh I thought I thought you, <laughs> oh, you said the mayor she, I, okay that's I, did, I just didn't believe the mayor I mean I didn't I don't believe that the mayor could have been moved by her threats <laughs> I can. I mean I after you're saying what you just said I I can see that I mean look at the he, people he had around him. It's just flawed decision making, but I can believe that he is a flawed decision maker. Yeah, yeah. It's just, I mean, yeah. Why you think schools got so bad in the first place? But I can agree with you on that. But, but guys, like you say, tell us what you would have changed. Like I say, um, put it in the comments. Let us know. And hey, listen, lean on us. All right, everybody, listen. You lend us, lend us. Okay, three, two. All right, everyone, use. I can do this. Three, two. 
All, All right, right everyone. everyone. You've lended us your ears. You've given us your tones. Now we need to pull out your middle fingers and let us know how many fucks do you give about this film. D, take us away. For those that are, uh, of you that are at the bar, three, oh, two, it's one. not so easy, is it, David? For those of you, <laughs> three, two, one. For those of you that it is your first time watching, I think that makes sense. One out of five. Uh, one out of five middle fingers we give each film one being that we couldn't stand it and five being that it could not have gotten better for <coughs> for like my review of lean on me this is the uh, beautiful david and goliath story it's compelling you're watching somebody uh, it's like joe versus the volcano actually did you really just compare something to the bible mm. you're such a sorry atheist I, I, I will, uh, it's Joe versus the volcano. Oh, no. There, oh, no. Oh, uh, uh. Hey. Uh, hey, uh, hey, 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 who? Hey, Chris, Stan. I'm just knowing that the majority of people out there understand David and Goliath is, is overcoming something that is that seems impossible, and you don't waver. Like I said earlier, I, I would argue that Joe never once wavers or questions himself, and it's refreshing to see a character that through a whole movie, they never have a crisis of identity or a crisis of, of like trying to remember what they're about or what their goal is or what they're going for. He is, he is on the same path from the beginning to end. There is no character arc for him. When you think about it, does anybody get out of their character? Everybody's committed because around Joe, you got to be who you're going to be. Say it. Look at me. You can't be the out. You know who did so? Sam showed the most range. One of the most people showed some of the most range. Remember when he first saw, mm -hmm. and he was like, "No, son, I can't go home." And then he was like, hey, "Let me get that food." And he was in the bathroom, and then yeah. yo suck on this. I mean, he, he was all over the place. The pills. <laughs> the pills. <laughs> it was the crack. Yes. Um, the whole movie from beginning to end is like an emotional roller coaster in a good way. It it has you. At least it has me on the verge of tears, like that feeling, the frog in my throat, from the beginning to the end of the movie. And it's either it's either heartbroken tears when um, her mom doesn't want her anymore, or it's happy tears when the school grades come in and he tells the mayor to fuck off. It's 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 a and and the uh, the ups and downs are perfectly laid out on the ride to to take you on this. Mm -hmm smooth thing and i will say with that on the on like talking about the emotion of it there was there are moments where it becomes like borderline cheesy uh the like the music montages where he gives the thumbs up to mr darnell when he breaks what was when, when the whole school breaks out into lean on me in a like a unique rendition of I'm it that's, stop you right there that's normal uh, that's not cheesy. That's normal. Okay. Because I mean, I've, I've been there with it, stuff like this broken if out. If the song existed prior, like, in the way that they sang it, I could see that being the case where everybody All knows the song. All those kids went to church at some point and were forced to go to church. I, I Listen, you don't have the skill or the steady hand to speak on this category. <laughs> okay, fine, fine. So I'll give you that. But even in that moment, while they're all singing Lean On Me, it shows the teacher crumbling up. Like, there, there's, there are these moments that or uh and even like the whole school out in front of the cl out in front of the jail chanting his name saying um you know free mr clark and they all have this like passionate speech ready to go like it it is it is like i i would feel kind of weird about watching this with somebody that's like super that that's really cool it's too cool for school literally i, 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 Somebody like, I mean like, it would be mean? it would i would be kind of like almost embarrassed to say this got me to a place of emotion because but it did the, though it, it did and I, i'm saying it but but there I, I i have to acknowledge that there is a level of cheese to it that i'm just i don't care I, what once the movie starts and the story is so compelling and the performance is so good i'm just along for the ride cheese and all and my last few points is that the pacing is awesome i never there's never a moment where i'm looking at the at the clock to see how much time is left mm -hmm. um whether the entire story is true or not it's compelling from the beginning to the end to watch you want to see what happens um and uh, uh, and like i said earlier i would put it up there with uh with rain man 
um, as far as like being that perfect balance between um, between raw emotion, drama, a compelling story, and then these like sprinkles of comic relief, just not even jokes, but just the characters being who they are in these situations. I found it kind of similar, but great in the same way. So with all that said, I give it a 4.5 out of 5. Okay. <clears throat> okay, so I will say this. When you talk about this film and I, you have to... To me, I've always, again, looked at film differently. I never want to be like, because I'm black, I'm watching a black film. I gotta love it because I'm pretty sure somewhere between Wu and a lot of the that I saw growing up, I'm like, yeah, that's not gonna be it for me. I'm gonna need I'm gonna need a film to be a film. Because I mean, don't get me wrong, there's a there's a name for that for, for when you're looking at Caucasian or white film, slapstick or something like that. Like, no, I knew what, I wanted to do film. I didn't want to do sketches. I laughed at Saturday Night Live. I laughed, I wanted to do film. And to me, I just, again, one of the first times where I said I'm not watching a black film. I am watching people do, like, the level at which the acting was displayed in this film. There are no explosions. Mm -hmm. There's one real action. Mr. Clyde, Mr. Clyde, some kids beating up Kid Ray. Now, you want to talk about cheating. Now, that was, okay, I, I'll give you, but, but, as, they, listen. They even threw the 80s. Like, but you don't understand. We punch it. Listen, but you have to understand. Let me bring you no, behind the veil. I'm here for it. Okay, well, I'm going to tell you. At least for, for me. For the next few years, from middle school all the way up into high school, anytime we saw somebody white get beat up, it was all like, you know, Kid Ray got beat up. It doesn't matter what the kid's name was. He was mm -hmm. Kid Ray because that we was we we you know we resonated with that. But with that being said, this film to me, it, that, let's, it has to check off so many factors. Number one, does it stand the test of time? Hell, yeah. Mm -hmm. And like we said earlier, these punk ass kids today to go to school, there's no way they could have survived during those times. I mean, you know what that shit might have been? What, what was that? Three o'clock high, or twelve high, or twelve noon when the guy had the brass knuckles and he tried to escape school earlier that day because the bully said he was gonna beat his ass at three three o'clock high or some shit like that, dude. That and then, but he had wound up getting the brass knuckles from the from like a school and he beat that bully's ass. That was one small step for punks and two small small steps for mankind. So, point being is when I say all of this, the acting in this. The directors and editing it to himself the time which they did it in like you say you are invested in this film you're invested in the characters there's some way for everybody to invest into that parent that single mother that's struggling mm -hmm. that that principal that has something to prove his friend who had the it's almost like joe clark was the one like i ain't with that voting shit. and then his his other friend was like i'm the one on the school board trying to get, make sure you got a job to be be a double agent you know what i'm saying like you see, we still we we're we doing this from both sides so they told so many storylines you know it's difficult as a writer to invest in all these characters Characters in a under 90 minutes for the most part and pull this off yeah and I'm gonna say this mostly I'm giving this film five for one one more reason because you know what they couldn't give him five letters O S C A R and that's what we call how many give it what did you guys think of the movie put it in the comments and uh, let's get into common attractions I know you're very excited about the next episode. I am. I'm not. Oh. What is it? <sighs> you know, I, <clears throat> guys, you know, <clears throat> we, we really haven't been able to, you know what, this may be the longest episode of season two because I, I think the theme is going to be hashtag Marvel. We don't always, ah, you asked me to do this and no, no. No, you've not, if you've not watched at least three movies, yeah, you finished WandaVision, you think you're some pro now. Anyway. No, that, I know less. I know <laughs> less after watching WandaVision, if anything. <laughs> All right, guys, next week. I know uh, about Boner. Oh, wow. Guys, next week, uh, you know, in season, I was going to call it the Battle of the Sherlock Holmes, which you really don't even know what that means anyway. But anyway, we have Benjamin Cumberbatch starring in Doctor Strange. It is going down in your part of uh, the Kamash town, and we're just going to be we're gonna we're gonna help David out, guys. How, we're gonna, how we're gonna do our how, how long? That's what she said. Now, we're gonna help David out. We're gonna do the little sparkly theme. We're gonna bring you into the world, man. Listen, man, just let it let it happen, man. This guy's an established actor. He's one of the real. He's almost he's almost one of you know what? I, he's probably the top five acting act like actor actors that are playing the Marvel character. I mean, you know what happened with Edward Norton mm -hmm. outside of that, but Robert Downey Jr. Chat with Bozeman, uh, uh, Paul Bateney, clearly. Uh, like, like there are certain guys that really do it justice. And he was the one I didn't even I had never seen him act before. I didn't even know he was Sherlock Holmes. But I, something something told me like this Doctor Strange shit is going to set it the fuck off. And you look, you know, you, your love for Tilda Swinton. Yep, I absolutely love her. She's she's you, you keep saying she you come. Oh, so you come over to the correct side of things. 
I, I, I understand that she identifies as a she, so I'm going to respect her identification request. But well, I, I don't know what the hell. If she you is. say something like that again, you can identify as a green light. You can go. <laughs> All right. So with that being said, guys, next week we got Dr. Strange. We're going to see what I did there. All right, guys, next week we got. Not <laughs> next week. Next episode. They think it's next week. No, it'll be two weeks. All right. Well, two weeks from this Thursday, two weeks from this Thursday, guys, we are going to the Marvel again. Like I say, it's our, we only do really one Marvel episode a year, but I am going to school him. I am going to show him what it's like to find his inner chi. We're going to talk about the just the Infinity Stones. You're going to learn about the Infinity Stones, how the gauntlet was made and why they did it in the Big Bang. And I, oh, and Cassilius, you are Cassilius. You get to finally meet, meet your antagonist, atheist friend. You're Cassilius. Your eye, you said you're going to do your eyes. Remember? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I get to wear eyeshadow. That's a plus. And you got to smack your hat back. Okay. <laughs> yes. I'm about to show a little chest. All right, guys. Uh, with that being said, that's what's going to be coming up next week. I can't wait to see who we put on the board for that one. Till I'm rooting for you, kid. <laughs> All right. Uh, don't forget to subscribe. Follow us on Patreon. Consider becoming a patron of the show. Uh, follow us on Instagram, Facebook, MySpace. AOL Instant Messenger, the CDs they still mail you, Betamax, uh, Beta Ray Bill, another Marvel character you know nothing about, but I'll stop. Man, you got to give it a chance, man. All right, everybody, that's the coming attraction. So listen, after Doctor Strange, hey, it's time to tell you guys what you can do. We want everybody to be safe, and if you can't be a stand-up guy, guess what you can do? What? Some time in our lives, we all have pain. We all have sorrow, but if we are wise, we know that there's always tomorrow. Why do we make it on me? Hey, when you're not strong, and I'll be your friend, I'll help you carry on. Why don't you subscribe? It'll last longer. <laughs>